Hello, everyone. My name is Alex Colvin, and I'm the Public Programs Curator at the Alabama Department of Archives and History. And I'm excited to welcome you to today's program, Alabama Women's History Series, Helen Keller, advocate and writer. And as always, this series has been created to complement our temporary exhibit, Justice Not Favor, Alabama Women and the Vote, which is open at the archives until May 31st, 2022. Before we begin our program, I have a few quick announcements about upcoming events. Please join us this Thursday, April 21st, for our Food for Thought series, Threads of Evidence, Investigating the Origin of a Confederate Flag Remnant, where two of our archive staff, Georgia Ann Hudson and Ryan Blocker, will examine uh, our Confederate flag conservation project and also the origins of one of our remnants. Now, this program is going to be in person in the Farley Auditorium and also live streamed to our Facebook and YouTube channels. So join us in person or online. I'd also like to welcome you to, uh, to another uh, Alabama Women's History series. Next Wednesday, April 27th, we're going to have Alabama history through art as Seneca Edwards Bush is going to tell us about two of her paintings that are on view in uh, Just Is Not Favor. Without further ado, I am excited to introduce you to today's speaker. Jeannie Thompson earned a BA in English and an MFA in Creative Writing at the University of Alabama. She's the founding director of the Alabama Writers Forum, a statewide literary arts service organization and partnership program of the Alabama State Council on the Arts. She is currently co-editor of a creative writing handbook for justice-involved youth and other at-risk students. Thompson has published five collections of poems, including The Myth of Water, Poems from the Life of Helen Keller, which was a finalist for the 2016 Forward Indie Poetry Book Awards. It is fitting that today we are speaker as a poet because this month is National Poetry Month. So please join me in welcoming Jeannie Thompson. Welcome, Jeannie. Hi, Alex. Thank you so much. Um, it's really wonderful to be here today. And I want to thank, first of all, the Alabama Department of Archives and History for hosting this series on women's history and for hosting the Justice Not Favor exhibit. And I want to give a little plug that it is open through the end of May. And so if you're in Montgomery, you should you should go in there and see it. The archives, Alabama Department of Archives and History is one of the great treasures of our state. It continues to grow and expand and develop. So please um, think of that as one of those stops that you want to go to and take your visitors from out of town to as well. Um, so I'm Jeannie Thompson and I am a poet of Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan Macy. And on the way to becoming a poet of these two amazing women, I studied and read and researched and began to see the trajectory of Helen's life as she literally gave it to the world. So I'd like to give you a little brief look into that world by talking about her inclination toward advocacy in a broader sense and several of the particular causes and conditions on whose behalf she advocated. And then at the end, we'll leave time, I hope, for some of your questions. But first of all, why do I call myself a poet of Helen Keller? I've never said that before. Well, that's because there are scholars, wonderful scholars, who are scholars of Helen Keller. I don't have a PhD, I have an MFA. And that takes me in a slightly different direction, but it doesn't take me away from research. One of the books that was most important to me um, in my process was Kim Nielsen's, and you can see all the tags in it, Kim Nielsen's Selected Writings of Helen Keller. She had the incredible task of going through all of Helen Keller's works, books, many, many books. She published 14 books, letters, essays, and compiling um, these pieces by subject and by chronology. It was very complicated. I don't know how they came up with the design for this in terms of how it's put together, but if you really want to see what Helen had to say as a writer, Helen Keller Selected Writings by Kim E. Nielsen. She is truly a scholar of Helen Keller. Um, and she's done other books on Helen. Um, another one that launched me into this uh, literally launched me into it because this was the first biography of Helen I read all the way through. This is Helen Keller, A Life by Dorothy Herman. And this came out in 1998. And it was a much more accessible and readable full life story of Helen 
uh, that sort of followed after Joseph Lash's uh, about this thick biography of Helen, which was comprehensive, but Dorothy Herman, um, I believe, adds a more creative and, and holistic flair in her book. But it was in this book by Dorothy Herman that I discovered that Helen Keller had had a life-changing event in Montgomery, Alabama, not that far from where I was living at the time I read the book. Um, but I have to tell you right away that the house that was told that I was told was Helen Keller's sister's house when this event happened is not the house. The house that the event happened in or on the front porch of was on McDonough Street. And that house is now, uh, it doesn't exist anymore. It was demolished, I think, during the time of creating the Interstate I-85. The house that most people in Montgomery know of as the Helen Keller House is on Felder Avenue. And the McPhillipses live there. And there's a plaque in the front yard saying this is Helen Keller's sister's house. But Helen Keller's sister didn't live there when Peter Fagan did not come to pick Helen up on the porch when they were trying to elope. More on that in a minute. Um, I have a chronology of her life in the, in the PowerPoint that I have, and I, we're going to go through that and look at some things with that, and here it is. Um, so I want to come back around to my theme here, which is Helen's heart for advocacy, and what does she have to say to us today? Um, this has kind of evolved over a long time, in my view, of Helen's timeless yet very contemporary thoughts on issues that we are grappling with today. And I'm not going to have to tell you what those issues are when we go through this. They're going to be dramatically evident. Um, but my point is, is that Helen had an inclination to be an advocate. And whether she was advocating for herself, whether she was advocating for other people like her, whatever the case was, you have to have empathy to have this, in, 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 excuse me, inclination toward um, advocacy. And ironically, even her own family didn't completely believe in um, Helen's giving Helen agency to be a human being in the world because they did uh, prevent her from from being married. And more on that in a minute too. Um, because I've spent my life working in the arts, I also just wanted to mention that Helen and Ann Sullivan Macy uh, had a great uh, affinity for the arts. And it, a lot of this came from Ann. And they loved sculpture. They went to Italy. Lots of things happened that uh, they didn't go together to Italy. Helen went to Italy. But my point is that as well as being a, um, a very passionate advocate, Helen also had a great sense of the way artistic expression uh, gives gives life to the human spirit. And I think those things do go together. And um, there's a poem in the book about the building of the Golden Gate Bridge. And I use that poem as a way to let Helen say something about her belief in the labor movement and why the labor movement was vital. And in this case, it was vital because it was about the, the protection of the lives of the workers. Um, so um, that resonated with me personally because my grandfather had been commissioner of labor in Alabama for Jim Folsom in his first term. And so we're both Alabamians by birth. And um, I think that maybe that's perhaps that's part of why we I resonated with her so much. Um, so now let's go to the um, to the chronology. Do I need to do that or can I do that? Alex. Here we go. So this is within this PowerPoint, there are three slides that have chronology in them or the, the chronology goes across three slides. I'm sorry. And the first thing I wanted to um, just start at the very beginning. Helen was born in 1880. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, maybe you can increase it on your own home screens. She was born in 1880 in, in uh, Tuscumbia. Her parents were Captain Arthur. Henley Keller and Kate Adams Keller. And this is the idyllic little place, Ivy Green in Tuscumbia. It was even more idyllic in 1880. Um, 19 months after Helen was born, she contracted some sort of a fever that caused her to lose her sight and her hearing. Um, nobody can say exactly what this was, although some people have, have think it was some sort of a brain uh, 
fever of her in her brain. Um, so her parents began this very painful journey of dealing with a child who was deaf blind. And by the time she was about six years old, she was very robust, uh, very active, and very uh, a child who was full of a lot of rage. And I'm sure she was rage, raging because she was isolated. She didn't have any way to communicate with the world except through the most rudimentary signs, but it was much more like um, she was she was completely isolated, completely by herself. And her family managed to get in touch with Dr. Alexander Graham Bell, who put them in touch with the Perkins Institute for the Blind. And Perkins, uh, excuse me, the director of Perkins suggested that Ann Sullivan Macy, who had recently graduated, and who was also also had some eye issues herself, would be a good person to come down and be basically a live-in teacher. So Sullivan traveled from Boston on the train to Tuscumbia, Alabama in 1887. Less than a, about a month later, uh, Sullivan had taught, had broken through with uh, Anne, excuse me, with Helen, and they had the miracle at the pump, which is the thing that if anybody, if you know anything about Helen Keller, you know that. Um, the, the moment at the pump was the moment when Helen began to understand that these movements in her hand and these little, these things, she understood that they were something, but she didn't quite figure out what they were. She finally figured out that they stood for things, that these movements meant the name of the thing. So every name, every object, everything had a name. And in this process, you've seen this dramatized and I've read about it and it does, the dramatizations are pretty accurate, but she, she was wanting to know what everything was. And so she patted on teacher, you know, like, what are you? And, and Ann Sullivan said, teacher, because that's what she was. She was her teacher. And that's how that name came to be. Um, so Fast forward to um, Helen's greatest life work, and you find her working for the American Foundation for the Blind, which she also helped found. And well into the 1950s, Helen was an international spokesperson for this. I'm going to say some more of that, about that in a minute. Raising funds uh, for disabled, deafblind people um, in this country and then later raising funds around the world and helping people make strides to be uh, self-sufficient even uh, you know with their disabilities and I just wanted to give a little um, shout out at this point that in Alabama we still have great work being done that in that area with the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind which has made many strides under the current leadership of Dr. John Massia and new avenues are opening for independent living and the success of deafblind adults in our state. So we are, um, <clears throat> we're still producing leaders in that area. So um, I want to, I'm sorry I'm jumping around here. It's a little bit hard to, to do this in 30 <laughs> minutes. Um, again, most people know Helen through the, the miracle work or the play. Um, but I just want to say that I think, that it was Ann Sullivan who initiated or instigated Helen's um, sense of advocacy, but combining with Helen's um, innate empathy. So let's look at a couple of other dates here. Um, let's see, in, in 1897, they moved up to, um, I'm sorry, having a hard time seeing this. Um, in 1886, Helen was accepted as a pupil at the Cambridge School for Young Ladies in preparation for attendance at the at Radcliffe. She became she was a student at Radcliffe. She graduated, the first uh, deaf blind person to graduate there, and she began to be sort of swimming in this world of reform movements in New England. I've got my um, Votes for Women pen on here that I purchased at the Archives and History. Um, museum shop, and I'm wearing this to illustrate that um, when you're advocating for a cause, you can never put it down. You always have to wear it in some, you always have to embody it. And so Helen was approached by many different um, 
causes and people. She was a suffragette, of course, a suffragist, sorry. Of course she was that. That was what you would be doing at that time in New England. And she did uh, participate in some demonstrations and marches and wrote about it. And you can, you can easily find that through the research. She was also interested in the labor movement. There were different um, political issues that she took, that she was uh, a part of. Um, but I want to zero in on her, her relationship with Japan. And uh, so I think we're ready for that first um, video. Alex, let's see. Here we go. I'm sorry, did, we didn't do this. Let's back up for a second. Um, Alex, can you uh, open that? Thank you. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, so this is, um, if, and Alex, if you could just kind of scroll down through it. This is the AFB, American Foundation for the Blind website. I wanted to give this a shout out so that you would know that it exists. It's in, they do incredible work. There's all kinds of research. And further down, um, right there under the quick links, if you want to stop there, uh, there's the Helen Keller section about her as an activist and a writer. And there are a lot of photographs and other things um, that can be, that you can access. So if you have any uh, personal interest in this, if you have a family member who needs these kind of services, um, that's available online. Um, so let's go now to the next, let's go to the video next. Um, all right. This highlights a couple of her, her, her issues. We'll just let you, I think we're not getting any sound though. Um, Alex, can you get the sound? Hold on with us folks. We're gonna try to see if we can get this audio. It's not, we're not hearing it. Do we need to do something different? Okay, well, we can go, we can just go on if, if you think it won't come up, Alex, just tell me what you think. What the voiceover is saying here is that Helen, whoops. She is unshaken when her campaign to prevent is that okay. working now? Caused by yeah, yeah. Disease evokes a furor. Her Frank Magazine article outrages the false morality. Well, I'll start it back over from the beginning. Okay. These are several things that she did that were timely. Okay. Thank you. Right, perfect. We will start it back here from the beginning. Okay. Thank you. Helen Keller writes vivid newspaper accounts of suffragette activity for the United Press, strongly supporting this and other social movements using her own best talent, words. The mechanics of writing are never easy for her. Anne Sullivan must read back to her every page she types. But publishers will buy Helen's writings, and she is the main support of the tiny literary household. She is unshaken when her campaign to prevent infant blindness caused by venereal disease evokes a furor. Her Frank Magazine article outrages the false morality of the day. The subject is taboo, but she has broken taboos before, and she feels she must speak out. Mr. and Mrs. John Doe are shocked, but more important, health authorities are grateful. Symptoms of success begin to appear. A ladies' group called the Sunshine Society is formed. Its purpose, to break through the stigma of sin surrounding infant blindness, to rescue blind infants from underprivileged homes. Shielded from view in darkened cradles, these children were being denied the proper care, which would afford them a chance to grow into whole personalities. Increasing numbers of reassured and probably relieved parents cooperate. Springtime, Washington. 
in the office of Harry Hopkins. The Works Progress Administration has established a project of making talking book machines for the blind. 5,000 of them have been made. And these talking books are available to the blind people of America through the lending libraries established by the Library of Congress. They may borrow these books in the same way that you borrow yours. It is the most comfortable way of reading that I know of and may well be envied by those of us who have sound sight. The person who suggested this project and is responsible for it is Miss Helen Feller who is not only the outstanding sightless person in America, but one of the Republic's foremost citizens. Talking books are compact, and they bring pleasure to thousands in America, while in another country, books take on a different meaning. A ranting and hostile Joseph Goebbels finds books dangerous. They give men ideas, open men's eyes. A great honor for Helen Keller. Her own writings breathe too much of freedom for the Nazis. They too are burned, consigned to the flames which soon engulf the entire world. Thank you. You can stop there. For the blind is finally bearing fruit. Okay, thank you. Um, so I like that. I wanted to use that clip. It's from a longer, a much longer uh, film about Helen. But if you um, if you notice in the very first part, uh, it talks it says that she was the main uh, breadwinner for the small literary uh, household, and that she was never afraid to speak out. So when she uh, took part in this campaign for preventable blindness, uh, which had to do with these these babies who were born blind, and they were the babies themselves were ostracized, and as you saw there, covered up in their cradles. And then uh, the people he referred to as Mr. and Ms. Jane, uh, John Doe <laughs> uh, and their false morality of the day. I love that. Uh, didn't want to talk about this because why? Because it had to do with venereal disease. And how do you get venereal disease? By having sex. So the whole thing was fraught with a lot of um, uh, false morality. I think that's a great term. So Helen managed to get people to talk about a subject that was taboo, but it had to do with health and the health of these babies. And also there was the other piece in there that many of these babies were from um, families or people who were disadvantaged. So that piece right there has many different um, social issues in it. Then the next one was talking books. And I thought, I'm sure you thought that was kind of funny when he said these books are compact. They certainly weren't compact, but uh, talking books was a project that someone brought to Helen. I can't remember who it was now and wanted her to endorse it. And at first she wasn't sure if it would work because um, it didn't, there was something about it she didn't quite like, but then she decided to be for it completely. And so she advocated for the money to be um, uh, allocated up to the American Foundation for the Blind so that they could produce these books and get them out there. And today this is a mainstay of libraries and the talking books are actually digital now. So they're much less, they're much more compact. And then a third, then the last one, um, I hope I don't have to tell anybody why that one is timely. Um, the, the whole idea that, that books could be burned and ideas could be squelched with fire to her was just ridiculous. And she said, um, and I need to get to the next slide for this. I'm sorry, it's, there it is. Um, this, is a, this is a copy of the letter that Helen wrote originally addressed to Adolf Hitler, Berlin, Germany, and that's scratched out. And it says to the student body of Germany, um, and it's a cablegram to these people. Um, she, she, I'll just read this. History has taught you nothing if you think you can kill ideas. Tyrants have tried to do that often before and their ideas have risen up in their might and destroyed them. You can burn my books and the books of the best minds in Europe, but the ideas in them have seeped through a million channels and will continue to quicken other minds. I gave all the royalties of my books. And I can't read that what that says, but I think it says published in German to the soldiers blinded in the world war with no thought in my heart, but love and compassion. 
Do not imagine your barbarities to the Jews are unknown here. And God sleepeth not, and he will visit his judgment upon you. Better were it for you to have a millstone hung around your neck. I'm sorry. Oops. And sink into the ocean, I think it says, than to be hated among mankind. Um, if you want to read this on your own, all you have to do is Google Helen Keller's letter to Adolf Hitler, and you'll find it. This was just a, this is an interesting artifact uh, that shows the the passion of her of her um, composition, and maybe there are some lines in there that we could use today. Um, okay, and then the next. Uh, let's see where we're going next here. Um, oh, to Japan. So I guess we'll queue up, uh, Alex, if you can queue up that other video, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, she had a, she and ha Annie Sullivan both together had a very important relationship with Japan. Um, and after Annie died, Helen fulfilled the promise to go to Japan and meet with the Japanese and uh, encourage the, the deaf blind people in Japan. That was in 1937, that trip. Then in 1940. Eight, she went back to Japan after the bombs had been dropped, and um, that's what the, that's what is illustrated in this video. So there's the there's um I think it sort of speaks for itself, but I guess let's go ahead and roll that. Thank you. Words appear. Tokyo, Japan hails Helen Keller. For the first time since before the war, Helen Keller pays a visit to the people of Japan. This time as a guest of the United States government. In Tokyo and other cities, the entire population turns out to cheer this great American, left blind and deaf by an affliction. To the Japanese people, Miss Keller's life is an inspiring example of what hope and determination can do. For she has conquered inconceivable darkness and isolation to become a world figure. At an outdoor event, Helen speaks before a huge crowd. Nowhere is Helen more widely appreciated, more deeply honored than in Japan. For the needs of their blind and deaf have been great. And twice she has toured their islands in aid of their afflicted. School children by the thousands line each route she takes, singing songs especially written for her. Rich and poor alike cherish her. She is respected as a woman and revered as a saint. Admirers line the streets as Helen's motorcade drives by. Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still recovering from the atomic bomb when Helen Keller went there on pilgrimage. Inside a memorial building, Helen is guided to shelves full of flowers and vases. Helen holds a large bouquet of flowers. Polly helps Helen gently set her wrapped arrangement on a wooden ledge. Now, at night, people gather outside. In a lake of shrines, the Japanese created an everlasting shrine for the memory of the great teacher, Anne Sullivan. Helen leans over a sculpture. Helen liked the first candle. The people of Japan will see that the light never goes out. The vertical stone sculpture stands near a calm lake. Thank you. Um, let me get past this. So, um, there's a lot there, but the main thing is that Helen experienced, um, she, ex she had experienced Japan prior to its being uh, uh, bombed. And when she went back, which is what these pictures depict and go along with the video, uh, the one on the left, I'm not sure which city she's in. It doesn't really matter because it was the same situation. You can tell by the look on her face and the way that Polly, Polly is signing to her what things look like, but Helen can feel it under her feet and she can smell it. And in the picture on the right, she's meeting, you can tell by their clothing, it's the same time. She's meeting with some other people. I believe some, I believe the man on the left may be a blind Japanese man, but look at Helen's face. You never see pictures of her like that. She never drops her, her mask of, you know, happiness that she wore all the time. And um, I want to just read you, um, I've got it, I think I have it on the screen over here, yes. She says, um, Hiroshima's fate is a Greek tragedy on a vast scale. For many years I have sensed profoundly the war-made wrongs and crookedness of mankind, 
But now it is more than a feeling. It is a concrete knowledge I have gained and a stern resolve to work for the breaking of barbarism and the fostering of uni universal peace. She had always, in her writing, she talks about being a pacifist and she was very much against World War I. Um, but I just wanna, I wanna read you one other thing that, she's, that she says about um, Nagasaki. Uh, she says, I felt the walls bending like a reed in the wind. We stumbled over ground cluttered in every direction with foundation stones, timbers, broken pipelines, bits of machinery and twisted girders. I felt sure that I smelt the dust from the burning of Nagasaki, the smoke of death. And she goes on and I, I but this is from Kim Nielsen's um, letters to, to Nella. Um, that was what that pushed her over the line. And it seems like it would probably push many of us over the line. But I just um, think about what we're seeing today and then seeing that video and it's not that different. Um, and so I try to, um, to bring out, bring this to a close. It's very hard to do. Let me read you um, uh, another, a couple of one, well, two quotes of hers and then I'll, um, I'll close out here uh, with with a poem. I think we're going to just skip over this, and um, yeah, we'll go, come back to that. Um, Helen, I, I just want to encourage everybody to read Helen's books, uh, spend some time with her, and listen to the sound of her voice. She says, "So long as the memory of certain beloved friends lives in my heart, I shall say that life is good. I long to accomplish a great and noble task." But it is my chief duty to accomplish small tasks as if they were great and noble. And then she says the highest result of education is tolerance. Again, um, a statement for today. And as for her heart for advocacy, she this is a quote that's quoted. It's it's quoted. It's um, repeated over and over again as people do with her. But I still think it's worth saying one more time because it does go to the heart for advocacy. I am only one, but still I am one. I can do everything. I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. That's a pretty good, <laughs> that's a pretty good uh, daily motto. Um, so if you'll indulge me, I would just like to read one poem from The Myth of Water. Um, that was inspired by what I read about Helen going to Japan and what you just saw um, in the video. And I guess you could take the um, take the PowerPoint down, Alex, at this point. Thank you. From a Japanese child along the parade route, Hiroshima, October 1948. Our teachers have asked us to greet you, to show respect a friend of our country, champion of the blind, a woman who cannot hear, you speak to us from your American heart. For 11 years, I obeyed my parents, honored ancestors. Now all my family rests in the one grave, instantly gone. What news can you bring us from your country? You look pale, sorry, you look sad beside the woman who tells you with her fingers what we say. She looks as if she would break into a thousand pieces. Does she miss her country? I would hold your hand. You could touch my face. I am not scarred. Carry home one soft, unwounded touch, a gift to your country. The persona poem is a way to empathetically enter a character. That's why this mode of writing poetry appeals to me so much. Um, these are not my words. These are words of a character that I've created in persona. And Helen Keller, um, she was the perfect subject. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, and I love that we ended with a poem. Like I said, this is National Poetry Month. And so it was so fitting to end with a poem 
uh, to tie it all back together. So thank you for that. Sure. Um, this is a time if uh, anyone in our audience has a question, feel free to put it in um, the comments, either on YouTube or Facebook. It will come through to us, so we'll be able to ask. Um, but I have a few questions of my own that I would love to start okay. off with. So you mentioned um, you mentioned she was for women's suffrage, um, and of course she's been uh, she's been featured actually in our exhibit, Alabama uh, doesn't that favor Alabama women in the vote. Um, how does her work for suffrage though work with all the other advocacy? Where does it fit in? Um, what what have you found out about it? Okay, well, if you don't have the vote, you can't make any impact on society. Yeah, I mean that's that's. That and talk about a, t a topic topic today, yeah. voter suppression. Um, so Helen, um, I think Helen, she probably thought, you know, this goes without saying, <laughs> we have to have the vote in order to make change. And we have to always, there it is, we have to always be advocating that um, all people do have the vote. I may have made it upside down there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, those of us who have grown up in situations where we were not oppressed from being able to vote sometimes have to be reminded that it's our duty, it's our job to go out there and make sure everybody can vote. Mm -hmm. And in, in Helen's time, in the early 20th century, the people who were most, well, one of the groups of people that was most overtly oppressed were women voters. And so how could you have a, a democracy when half of the population by gender uh, couldn't vote. I can just see her going, well, that goes without saying. So um, yeah, so that's how suffrage is. Suffrage is kind of like the baseline of, of yeah. all of it. And so you have to have to have that advocacy, to have that ability to change. You have to have right. a vote, that voice. Right. Without a voice, you cannot enact change. Right. So that's, it's perfect because it, it really is. And that's really what the foundation, and, and thank you for promoting the, exhibit at the beginning to talk because sure. you know, that's why she's there at the beginning is because she's one of those foundational people who tells us about reform and how that's so important to the story of suffrage. Um, right. So that's why it's, I'm just so excited to have you here today. And we have um, some questions that just came through and so okay. I'd love to, to ask. So um, Marilyn Sheely Kavanaugh, who were the relatives she supported in her home? So who was she okay. supporting? Well, it was really, it was, uh, it was Ann Sullivan was the person with her because Helen and Ann, and again, I'm sorry, I skimmed through this really quickly. They were a duo, they were a mm -hmm. pair and they wanted to be, um, they really wanted to be financially independent for obvious reasons. But um, so there weren't any family members that she was supporting. It was Ann, Helen and Ann who were, um, it's hard to describe what their relationships were, that was, Annie was her teach. Ann was her teacher then they became colleagues and friends and sort of comrades in arms in a lot of ways. Uh, so that's, she was supporting herself as a writer. And, um, and there, of course they had to have some, you know, a gardener and somebody to help them do, they couldn't do everything. So she was the major breadwinner. So she was kind of helping. That support answers it. Yeah. She was helping support yeah. like her own lifestyle, but it's with all these other people who are a part of her network and her. Um, right who are helping her. She has also helped them. Uh, perfect. And we have one from Joanna Jacobs. Can you tell us something about the title of your book? Uh, what about the well-known story of the water and the pump do you consider a myth or is it a reference to something else? So can you tell us about that? And um, Joanna also asked another question about uh, if we want to read your book about Helen Carroll, where can we buy it? So can you answer okay. both of those right. for everyone? This book was published by the University of Alabama Press. Thanks for asking that, Joanna. Um, and you can find it uh, wherever you buy your books online. It's available in a lot of places. Uh, ask your local bookstore. It's not out of print. And so, um, you know, Amazon, Alibris, wherever you, wherever you get books. I love it when people go to a bookstore and say, do you have it? And they're going to say no, because it's poetry. Uh, they might have it in Tuscaloosa, I'm not sure, but please, uh, you know, kind of nudge your local bookstore. But if you, if all else fails, write to me, I have copies and I'll be glad to send you a signed one if you would like to do that. Um, Alex can give you my contact information if you get in touch with her directly. Um, now the title of the book, okay. Um, there's a poem in this book called The Myth of Water. Actually, it's called... <coughs> Excuse me, the myth of W-A-T-E-R spelled out. 
Um, and it goes in a lot of directions, but in the, in the play, The Miracle Worker, if you remember that, when Helen, when they depict Helen and Annie at the pump and, and Helen goes, wah, wah. She did not say wah, wah. Okay, that's, that's a dramatic uh, technique to convey to the audience what's going on inside the character's head. Um, she might have in her brain somewhere some kind of language traces that had, you know, but no, she didn't utter the word wah, wah. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's one myth. And the other myth, I think, is the idea that was like her life was this and then at the pump it came this thing like a Walt Disney movie but there was a continuing developing of Helen all the way along there were many moments like that and so I had her at the end of the book this is when I was getting toward the end of it and I wanted her to get sort of uh, uppity I guess would be the right way to say it <laughs> so I had her say um, let me see if I can find it right quick um, I bet I said you can have your you can you know you can have your miracle here it is it was not a single word and there was no utterance in other words it all didn't happen at once mm -hmm. that's what the myth of water means it's just it was it was um it was much more profound and much less walt disney than what that scene is always depicted and um there's a new sculpture at ivy green by the sculptor Craiger brown that was um, uh, commissioned by the Lions Clubs International. And I just realized that we just skipped over the Lions Club slide. I'm sorry, I'm gonna come back to that if there's a minute. Um, and uh, so they wanted a sculpture to commemorate um, an anniversary of the Lions Club, I believe. And she, so Craiger did this sculpture and in the sculpture, um, it is the moment at the pomp but it's it's kind of it's different from what you would think, and and mm -hmm. I've heard him talk about it, and he's trying to depict what I'm saying that there were, that things were happening in many directions here. It wasn't just one thing, but Lions Clubs International um, took Helen's challenge to be the Knights K N I G H T S of the Blind, mm -hmm. and to support uh, the American Foundation for the Blind. And there's a famous story behind that. And there's a fabulous dramatic depiction of Helen giving the speech that you can find. Um, you could probably find it on the AFB website. But she stood up and said, we, I need you, we need you to be the Knights. And they were they like, OK, we're on board. So she was <laughs> talk about a, a fundraising moment. I mean, she it was a competition. Several people pitched to them. And she wrote the speech and delivered the speech orally mm -hmm. oh, because wow. she worked very hard to do that. And it was hard to understand her, but she she worked very hard. So um, I take that as a uh, an encouragement moment when I'm in my fundraising uh, depths of despair <laughs> sometimes. Uh, you know, I think about that. And if Helen could do that, then I could do that. So, Joanna, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> No, that's and that's that's a perfect answer because, it, like you said, it's not just um, you know there's that moment in the movie that can give us inspiration and it's great mm -hmm. and it's this instantaneous. But really, it was this long, hard journey for her, and it wasn't instantaneous. It was that she didn't stop; she kept trying to learn, and um, that that story of perseverance, in many ways, is even like more inspiring than it happening kind of in that one moment. Um, but so, uh, oh, we have another one here. From Scotty E. Kirkland. Oh, Scotty, hey. Jeannie, which of Keller's works is your favorite? <laughs> so which one would you, if someone wanted to read uh, a little bit of Helen Keller's work, what would you okay. suggest? All right, I've got two favorites. May I have two? You, you of <clears> course, <throat> you may have two. Uh, the first one is one that's not as well known. It's called Helen Keller's Journal. Mm -hmm. I found copies of it, you know, original printing copies of it online. It wasn't very expensive. Helen Keller's Journal is the chronology of the six months following Ann Sullivan's death, Ann Sullivan Macy's death. And when Helen is in deep grief, but she goes on this, she goes on this trip to Europe and she goes all over. And so she's writing, sometimes she'll be writing her deepest grief. Other times she'll be writing um, some about some public thing she did and she was with somebody, but it's, um, you know, we have a lot of books on grief these days. This is a book about 
um, grief and overcoming. And at the end of it, she's ready to launch off and go to Japan. And I found lots and lots of things in there that inspired poems in the book. And the book was published like within um, months, I think. I mean, weeks almost of when uh, she finished that trip. Okay. So I'm sure the publisher was saying, come on, come on, let's have this book out. But Helen Keller's journal, I would definitely look at that. And the other one is um, Teacher, which was Helen's biography of Ann Sullivan Macy. And for those writers on the call, you'll appreciate this. Helen wrote a draft of it. Um, she had a hard time writing it. And so she actually had to go on these trips like to Europe in order to get away from everything to write. She wrote the book. Um, it was in the attic of her house in Connecticut that burned to the ground while they were in Europe, while she and Polly were in Europe. No computers, no printouts. So she had to start over from scratch and rewrite the book. Oh, and wow. so this whole process took about 20 years. And it was published um, in the late 50s, I think. But this is Helen writing about Ann Sullivan Macy as her teacher. And so from the perspective of being um, like in her 70s and looking back on her life. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes an interesting book into the story of my life, which is very Walt Disney, in my opinion. Uh, but it was also put together as a project. If you want to do, if you want, I just put this in here. The story of my life is given to school kids to read and it inspires people and, you know, and all like that. But the one you need to get uh, if you want to really dig into this, is the 100th anniversary edition that has notes from all these different people in it, including mm -hmm. Roger Shattuck, the critic who helped work on it. And, and then you then you understand a lot more about how that particular document was put together. Exactly. She didn't sit down and write the story of her life. There were different things that came together and John Macy worked on it. But but um, so I guess, Scotty, I have three. I have the 100th anniversary story of my life, teacher and Helen Keller's journal. Perfect. No, that's a great place <laughs> to start. And then okay. as you get into it, you can keep kind of going in and, and right. she has all these different writings that you can delve into if you're interested in learning from Helen Keller's perspective. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot. We had another quick question. Uh, did Helen Keller ever come back to Discumbia and Ivy Cream? Oh, yeah, she did. She did. Uh, she visited um, uh, I can't tell you all the exact dates, but she and Annie came back to Tuscumbia and spent some time there. Um, Helen, of course, spent time in Montgomery at different times at Mildred Tyson's home. Uh, she came back. There's some photographs of a trip. I don't know the date of it. I would say Helen was in her 50s. And she arrived on the train, maybe either in Athens or Decatur, and they, they motored over to Ivy Green. And there was a big, you know, public thing that happened um so yes they did she did come back some but um you can imagine that being a very brilliant woman and living in boston and having all of the conversation and and intellectual stimulation and everything there that it really wasn't to be that she was ever going to come back yeah to tuscumbia which was a beautiful place but um it didn't have those kind of intellectual opportunities for her. And the resources that she needed for yeah. her yeah. advocacy and to, and to continue yeah. her work. Oh, she did start. I have to say this. She yes. did start. She and Annie uh, were discour discouraged that there was no library. There's no public library in Tuscumbia. And so they uh, urged this woman's group that Helen's mother was a part of it was a book club or a women's club, reading, you know, study club. They said, we have to have a library. Y'all have got to get a library started. So they did. And then they sent them some books. And I was very honored to be part of the 100, I believe it was the 125th anniversary of that library celebration in 2018. Oh, that's amazing. The oldest, the first chartered public library in Alabama, I'm pretty sure. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jeannie, for telling You're us welcome. about Helen Keller, about her advocacy, um, and for this inspirational story of perseverance and kind of working to change the world and make it a better place. Um, and I encourage everyone to come and see This Is Not Favorite, Alabama Women in the Boat. You can see how Helen Keller fits into this larger story about Alabama women shaped their society. And thank you again, and I hope to see everybody on Thursday for Food for Thought.
Okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.